Hi, everybody. I'm John. Just so you, and this is Dave. Hi, Dave. Just so you know who's who. So we're excited to be here to talk about integration today. I mean, that's certainly the theme, particularly here in the Red Room. Um, so we're very happy to talk about that. Um, so I want to spend just a moment or two about Fidelity itself just to um, help you understand a little bit about um, why integration is so important. So Fidelity is a large shop, um, one of the largest financial companies in the world. Uh, and there's a full range of products. So what is that range of products? So four quick things that Fidelity does. One, we are an investment management company. We own and operate several hundred mutual funds uh, and all the holdings within that. And then there's what we call personal investing, where if you want to buy stock in a company, you can do that, open an account with Fidelity. Um, we also have what's called workplace investing. Uh, so if you want to have a 401k plan through your company, we can manage that for you. And by the way, um, anybody have a Fidelity account? Wow, thank you for your business. That's very <laughs> nice. Um, how many of you work in the financial services industry? Uh, okay, a lot, of, a lot of shop talk today. This will be good. Um, yeah, and, uh, and lastly is um, the institutional marketplace. And I like to refer to that as where um, people manage other people's money. So you can have a financial advisor to help you with your plans. And we do that from an integration perspective at a very large scale. Um, we help banks, correspondents, broker dealers, large and small, um, do their business so that when you trade through small company bank, under the hood, it's Fidelity. And that's a very great enabler, but it takes a lot of integration. So we're going to talk about that. So just a quick history uh, of innovation. This is a point of pride. Uh, no, I was not there in 1965 when we bought the first mainframe. Um, but that was pretty exciting um, in Boston. And then in 1974, we, we allowed uh, the selling of mutual funds over the phone, which at the time was breathtaking, uh, and had the SEC very much nervous. Um, and we proceeded to then allow you to call in at the very early wave of an IVR to be able to get a quote um, on your holdings uh, 24 hours a day. Um, and then more recently, you know, in the late mid-90s, uh, we launched the, uh, one of the earliest uh, websites for a mutual fund company. And then as time moves forward, you know, when the uh, Apple Watch came out, we were there day one. So what is the show that Fidelity is a privately held company? Uh, we make what we think are the right investments to enable technology for our customers, and the Apple Watch is just one example of being there on day one. But that's not all. As we move towards the future, we've got virtual reality, uh, digital currencies, and of course the whole robo-advisor scene. And all of those things will require massive amounts of integration that we'll get to. <coughs> so how did we get to the point where we're at at Fidelity? Well, we, again, just a quick history recap. Um, in 1999, we created a legacy middleware that's still in production today, 18 years later, um, doing some plain old XML to CICS COBOL uh, maps. Uh, we still are a very large mainframe shop, and it's a very big necessity for us. Um, we can't just decompose and refactor the universe of brokerage overnight, so that will take a while. And as things went forward, we had our, our first external API gateway, uh, which was to an underwriting company in Indiana. Um, at the time, we were doing uh, life insurance. Uh, we still do life insurance at, at Fidelity, and we would send out the applications to underwriters. Um, and then finally, we upped the game a little bit uh, using a, a new vendor product, a second generation, if you will, uh, SOAP with outside business partners. And then we move forward to where we are today, where we're now really uh, using RESTful interfaces with our uh, business partners. We, uh, we've been using the governance registry for quite some time now to good effect. And also now we'll begin to have the power of exposing that online catalog of the store. And if you were here earlier, you heard uh, the gentleman from StubHub kind of talk about his uh, adventure in that area. And supporting that, of course, is WSO2. <coughs> um, so that's kind of just the context, if you will. And I'm going to kind of uh, turn it to Dave a little bit to talk a bit more about some of the specifics of how that integration happens. Uh, thanks, John. So um, <clears throat> as mentioned, it, uh, Fidelity has always been a very um, technology-centric company. And we have been thinking about a, an API economy and an e API ecosystem for quite some time. And actually, we've been exposing APIs for, for several years in our current implementation. So we're no stranger to onboarding people with APIs. Uh, but fundamentally, those are all SOAP. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a SOAP shop. Uh, throwing around WSDLs isn't always the best thing uh, or the easy thing to do in a, in a restful and, and swagger-based world. So um, we've taken a look at this holistically throughout the company and, and see 
the, the distinct advantage that an API uh, ecosystem is going to give us. And as we look at this, um, there's uh, four fundamental quadrants that uh, we are implementing. Uh, certainly uh, from the, the left to the, to the right, we're looking at the API management system. So APIM uh, is going to be used to actually uh, provide the ability for us to discover, examine, prototype. And that's important because while <coughs> our sales cycles in FPT are long, um, then it gets fast and furious when we onboard large companies that need access to our APIs. And we're hoping to provide uh, a more agile and efficient way to do that. Uh, try before you buy kind of things, exposing the stuff, not only for external, as we'll get to, and John will uh, talk to that, but for internal, uh, to promoting more reuse of our APIs, cross use uh, amongst divisions, and actually, um, you know, a, a finer, better normalization to the kinds of APIs and business capabilities that we're using. Um, <clears throat> to the right, um, obviously, in doing the business that we do to large companies and then companies who broker our, our APIs on behalf of other people, there's, there's, there's lots of concern about security. There's lots of concern about throttling. <coughs> um, some of our worst uh, offenders are our own business units. Um, they put APIs in with a bug, and certainly we see a spike, and, and, and that needs a, a lot of throttling. Um, it's, it's not cheap to let an API with a problem go several times back to our mainframe. I mean, obviously, those are protected MIPS. So, so the notion of throttling, gating, understanding who you are, <clears throat> doing a better job at identity, um, which is a cornerstone of the gateway. I mean, I never learned so much about security. I'm obviously, I spent a lot of time building uh, application services and brokers and business process management system for a large blue company, and security was the cornerstone. So I know SAML, I know OAuth, I know lots of OpenID Connect concepts, but I never had to implement them, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> really. So, so now I had to implement them, and I, uh, in the audience is my colleague, Sue Bamas, who's our security architect at FPT. I, I learned a ton, and, and, and the ways we've integrated, I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. <clears throat> so that's a cornerstone. And then, um, you know, we, we're a soap shop. Um, one of the good things about soap is it's a standard. It's got security on it. It's got validation. It's got <clears throat> lots of good stuff that are really kind of a nice entry point to our service there. However, we're going REST. So when you go REST, <coughs> you don't have the ability of, uh, and REST JSON, you don't have the ability of validation, some of the things that, that, that concern us. We pa repackage headers. So <coughs> the need for a uh, API facade pattern, which uh, is augmented by the enterprise service bus, is, is what we've done. And um, that, that's kind of a cornerstone of the execution model. <coughs> um, then, um, in front, uh, actually in front of all that, and, and we mentioned that uh, this piece right here is kind of significant. We've been in production with that for about two and a half years. <coughs> um, SOA is, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, is sacred in our company. I mean, we practice SOA. My boss has is, is actually uh, provided a lot of the, the thought leadership in SOA uh, throughout the company. So we, we, we do practice service orientation. <coughs> um, we do contract first. We have business capability lists. We had lots of things that we wanted to govern better, so we implemented the governance registry, and we've done a lot of customization in that that I'll get to uh, as well. But that really is the cornerstone of the service tier and the API tier. And actually, we use that for publishing too because we've done a lot of customization to get that done. <coughs> so, so that's essential and for, for visibility. It does provide us with this little goodie here, which we call the enterprise store. That's internal, so all fidelity, um, all Fidelity business units can see all the services in there. They can only touch the ones that they want, and, they, and we manage life cycles uh, around the service development with that. And then finally, um, we do a lot with analytics, obviously, and uh, <clears throat> have one of everything in, in the analytics and big data space. So we're extremely interested in the degree of analytics that we'll collect through this structure and allow us to uh, look at the effectiveness of onboarding our customers and uh, abuse, uh, where things are coming from, uh, lots of good stuff. So we've implemented the, uh, the DOS, Data Analytics Server. Um, I've actually got a plan to customize a little bit of that. We're using uh, CEP in the, uh, in the Data Analytics Server to provide some eventing and streaming. <clears throat> and from that streaming, we, we're going to sift out our own uh, custom schemers to get a better picture of near real-time data, and then eventually uh, drop that into our uh, central reporting platform which is uh, done on open source uh, stuff for, for, for rate of reuse. So, so those are the quadrants of processing that, uh, that we've been implementing. I guess next slide, John. <clears throat> so
So coming from the top, we, we look at the, um, the registry. Um, in our registry, we, we uh, have a big uh, need to provide uh, contract first. So uh, in today's world, uh, we want that to be swagger. In yesterday's world, that's fundamentally WSDL. So we start with that contract. That contract is associated with several things like business capabilities. There's a huge, we use ServiceNow. Uh, everything and everything we do, software components, hardware components, and everything is managed with an app ID and in ServiceNow. So that's all coupled to the governance registry. There's actually, we've implemented callbacks to ServiceNow to vet each and every component that we, we add there. So we provide, you know, the, con the utility contracts, the API uh, notifications, lifecycle. Uh, we did a lot of work with customization on, on some of these artifacts here. So, so we, each business unit has its own RTX. We've customized them. As you can see, FBT REST and SOAP versus some of the other pieces we have in there for, for PI and WI. <clears throat> so uh, each life cycle is unto the business unit. Um, we enforce that. Um, so we had to do a lot of customization for life cycle management onto the business unit uh, roles and, and uh, um, that, are, that are actually achieved through LDAP and Active Directory so that you can touch certain things, you can advance life cycles. And, and that's <clears throat> pretty important to, to the, the notion of service development. So um, we have a lot of artifact types that are used in the process, certainly APIs, uh, business capabilities we added uh, uh, this year. So we used to have, you know, okay, contract first. Uh, business capabilities. We had a big spreadsheet that was held in a central place <laughs> that, that uh, basically defined all the business capabilities we have. Well, that's all been formalized now in the, in, the, in the governance registry, so you can actually go and look it up. We're trying to normalize those because we really don't need seven ways to move money. We probably only need one or two. So this is going to help us normalize that process based on, uh, along with service now, as we start to introspect our organization and understand what we really need to do business in the financial services industry. <clears throat> Then we have, uh, you know, our back-end endpoints. That's all soft, so the ESB basically goes off and, and picks up the endpoint. We do a lot of elaborate routing um, that's, uh, that's essential for efficiencies in the, in the, in the structure. So uh, that's used uh, as another component to do that. <coughs> we have our REST and SOAP services. <coughs> uh, we have product, nap, uh, uh, product ID and app mapping. It basically comes up with uh, things that we collect from the outside world and the apps that actually do that in conjunction with uh, the Snow ID. And, and, and that's that. So, Dave, maybe I could just add, uh, you know, for those who were here to hear Jason from Arizona earlier this morning, one of the questions that Dave asked him was, what if one agency wants to see what the API offerings are for another agency? And that was, that's a difficult hurdle for them to clear. Right. This allows a very large organization of Fidelity to let various business units and product lines see their offerings to each other. And that's really a very foundational thing. And Jason was right to really call that out as an inhibitor until you provide this kind of offering for folks inside. Thanks. So we try to you know, publish and govern our artifacts. This is the, the execution structure. We, we have, um, uh, well, I entered this thing two years ago as uh, sort of the lead architect for, for implementing the FBT API management system, but I got a lot of help from a lot of the uh, people that went before me in personal investments, and, and we were, they were able to share a lot of stuff. So uh, they had done a lot of customization on the governance center, so the notion of a single UI being able to do all of this and then a central place to do publishing to implementations by business unit to the execution tier was, was a huge piece of integration and we've actually done it, it works pretty well. There's been some issues with that uh, because we're sort of um, you know, stuck around uh, 1.8 and 2.0. Uh, but uh, but it, it does work uh, functionally well, and it does allow uh, one central point of UI to actually do the management that you need for lifecycle, and then do the management that you need for the API, and then actually publish the API to the respective endpoint that I'll show you in a minute. So that's it. Um, <coughs> uh, very, very, very big use of the governance registry central to Fidelity, and um, you know it, it is a cornerstone of, of everything we do with APIs and, and services. So uh, just, we'll go through this quickly, uh, just a minute to the point. So our service life cycle in FBT basically starts out with a, a business-driven service contract. So on that we have, I, I mentioned business capabilities, context levels, policies. We try to provide alerting so that as you move things to a life cycle in a respective role, alerts get cut through emails and whatnot to notify people of change. Um, in an API first 
uh, development philosophy. Uh, so, so it was interesting. Uh, our life cycle used to be, is long. It has about maybe 10 steps. And the actual uh, emission of the API contract came too far down. So uh, the, a lot of our personal investing uh, folks realized that. In an agile world, you want to sort of expose your API contract out first. So we actually uh, uh, separated that so that we can actually publish an early release of the contract, maybe the Swagger document out first to get people to try it in the store while the service is actually going on and being, uh, and being built. So this is an agile, iterative process, and it has allowed us to expose things, and we're hoping that it, it'll help us with our onboarding of facilities in, in the future. <coughs> so um, uh, governance is a good, a good portion of, uh, of what we do in the, in the, in the, in the SOA business. Uh, by the way, we're also, uh, as John mentioned, uh, we have a long history with uh, fundamentally mainframe technology uh, that works extremely well. Uh, we have a, a, a gateway system and we have a, a basically an entry point called our exter external channel access uh, interface that actually does all the routing, all the caching, all the, the, the pushes out to the mainframe. Uh, that's fundamentally a lot of CICS and, and DB2. And, and all that stuff is being re-engineered as we speak well. So it's our responsibility in architecture not only to take apart the front door, which is going to evolve uh, us to a, a digital co computing platform uh, from where we are today, but also our back-end service tier. So uh, that's all going to be Java, uh, all going to be uh, uh, basically uh, native store procedures. So uh, we're, we're engineering the finer grain service pieces and implementing that uh, and managing that through our governance registry as well as exposing out new APIs that they'll actually get to them. So that's our life cycle. <coughs> um, our store. Um, I'm, we <laughs> are laying out an A-rated application. Now in Fidelity, that's a big thing because we're tolerant to 20,000 transactions a second. Um, and this infrastructure that we have today does that. Um, we, we, we pride ourselves on it. So we're transforming ourselves to deal with um, the infrastructure that I just told you about, which will exist in probably three uh, data locations and, and eight zones, all, all connected to our, um, our F5 uh, load balancing system, all fault tolerant, all 24-7, all continuous delivery. And, all I, and we're laying all that out, and all I ever heard talk about is this store, <laughs> which is a try-it place. But uh, I can't tell you how much excitement this has in Fidelity for our brokerage as a service notion. And I want John to talk a little bit about that, because he's been doing a lot of the yeah, shepherding. So Dave is right. It really is, from a tech perspective, it is, no, uh, it's the tip of the iceberg from a technology stack perspective. Uh, all the machinery that supports it uh, is certainly fronted by the store. But think about the practice over the last eight to 10 years, and I'm sure many of you do this. You email a WSDL to your business partner or a Swagger to your business partner. Wouldn't it be nice if they could come to a place electronically and get that? Um, so WSO2 provides the means for us to have that online catalog so people can search, find, discover, uh, try out, sign up, and do all those kinds of things that today we do through out-of-band management practices, uh, which gets the job done but doesn't allow us to really scale and rapidly add uh, new business partners as well as we would like. So this is really going to up the game. And of course, there's two um, user groups here, you know, the, the thousands of developers inside Fidelity who need to find and use APIs. And again, for our, our thousands of external business partners, they have developers who need similar type of information, and we need to make that available to them. So this is really going to up the game from a brokerage perspective to make this available for banks, correspondents, broker dealers to find the APIs they need to use Fidelity's core capabilities uh, in their business model, which works well for them. Um, obviously, there's uh, two different security models from people who are inside and outside. Uh, but again, uh, th this generates a lot of excitement because it's the thing you can see. Uh, but what you don't see below the waterline is the rest of the iceberg, is the gateway and all that stuff that Dave will talk about in just a minute. So to me, uh, the most essential thing that, that I have is this, this little technology in the middle here that we, I was so happy to see that uh, Ballerina is kind of based on Swagger. Uh, and it's really in its DNA because uh, I think the notion of, of exposing a contract that, that, that actually provides documentation as well is huge. So to me, that element in the store, in the try it space, is, is, is huge. Um, when you start tossing WSDL around the store, it's clumsy. It, this isn't WSDL friendly. It's a REST system. So while we'll do it, 
um, our, my direction and our direction is absolutely rest uh, JSON to the outside world. Um, I came through um, a very big blue company that, uh, whose philosophy was mobile first, which was actually the onset of a lot of the, the notions of APIs that we see because mobile actually needs that. And, and, and I, I can't say how much I like the notion of swagger in the store and being able to try it, uh, prototype mode uh, or not. Is, is an essential technology. So, and then the subscription process. So if you look at the way we subscribe and the security around that and the onboarding and then who has the authority to set up the application, expose that to the APIs, provide the credential into that thing, a lot of internal fidelity uh, workflows had to, has to be, had to be looked at to, to, to implement that. So, so the whole notion of subscription, which John has been working on and my colleague Sue has been working on is really something you have to look at to, to, to get things on board and it will in time streamline our ability to do that. I don't know that we would ever let it, people pre-subscribe, but, uh, but there are specific roles that, that control that that are actually done and then obviously the metrics that we get out of all that by user, by subscription, by uh, API is, uh, is actually huge for, for the management piece. So um, that's really what the, the, the benefits of the store are. The only thing I would add to that is, you know, most of the revenue models for large firms like Fidelity are either assets under management or number of accounts. Uh, having this kind of analytical capability allows us to maybe introduce a new price point. Um, you know, how many inquiries? Uh, what, how, did you exceed your TPS? So maybe there's some spot pricing there. So having this kind of apparatus gives the business the ability to shape revenue models differently than we traditionally have had in the past. Absolutely. Monetizing APIs is, is so important. So first you have to understand it. This will allow mm -hmm. us to understand it so we get a better view of monetization as well. So next. So this is sort of a actually 100,000 foot view of what we're foot. doing. <laughs> But, uh, but for, for our consumers out here that are, as we mentioned, pretty much large institutions, uh, both on a B2B and uh, C2B kind of uh, action, um, we have our own um, uh, DMZ apparatus, which is uh, pretty sophisticated security. Um, we, between this line and that line, there was a lot of uh, two-way SSL, one-way SSL. Um, and that's the way we do business. Obviously, you're not going to use mutual auth in, in this game. So we had a, a, my colleague Sue in the audience here has, has done a wonderful job of convincing these people to support OAuth. So we're supporting OAuth uh, across the board now. As such, we hit our gateway. Our gateway has an implicit um, uh, arrangement with IDS. We've customized our great gateway to provide handlers so that we can actually vet that in IDS against our third party token providers. So that's the central point for, for all of our validation. <coughs> in IDS, we, uh, we're using Zocmo for, for a lot of our policies. So we started uh, a, a prototype of that. That's going to control the pretty much cost grain access to our back end service tier. So we've done a fair amount of customization in the gateway. So obviously we're looking through throttling and I have a little more uh, of a domain model in, in a second that I'll show you. And, and, and we've customized IDS. IDS is, is really kind of a cornerstone for security for a federated model, which is what we need uh, going forward. And these two things work together to, to provide uh, clearance to the back end. Uh, then I mentioned uh, a lot of the rest to, to SOAP behavior. Fundamentally, we're a soap shop, um, so, so a lot of these uh, uh, whistles are at, the, are at this level. Those get uh, basically uh, handled in our ESB. There's a huge investment that, uh, that was originally uh, onboarded and, and created by our PI guys called the Digital Platform. And it, we have a bunch of core ESB functionality. It's actually a cooperative uh, shared kind of a library. Uh, of, of sequences <clears throat> that, uh, that is a community in Fidelity that's actually used to do a lot of things. Uh, repackage headers, validate headers, validate account numbers, do all the things you can't do in REST that would have done uh, pretty much in SOAP. So we, we do a lot of uh, transformation here um, and, and repackaging and augmentation uh, to our service tier, which is fundamentally supported by, by WSDLs. However, the, mesh, the, the notion, of, and we have uh, five new APIs coming out that are total REST end to end. Uh, Java and, and native store procedures. So, so this is this is really the the apparatus that's used to to control the runtime. 
Uh, obviously, the analytics server gets communicated to by gateway and also ESB. So we have a lot of plans for, for that on the back end in conjunction with HBase and Hadoop, which are our, sort of our, our large big data stores where we have Tableau uh, kinds of uh, dashboards of reporting that will hopefully uh, uh, augment that. So that's, that's really a, a lash up. I mean, obviously, in a 24-7 in A-rated uh, application, there's, there's lots, of, <laughs> lots of instances of this. I, I figure fully boated, we'll probably have, I don't know, maybe 90 servers. Uh, this is fully clustered. We're using Hazelcast between a lot of them. Hazelcast, not my favorite, but, uh, but we're using it. <laughs> um, I'm really, really excited. I spent a lot of time in my life in data flow, process flow, micro flow, all those kinds of flow engines. And I was really, really, and, and, and with some of the people in this technology space, I was really happy to see this notion of ballerina. So to see a, an integration language and an integration engine, engine kind of a, a, a rendered like that is, is, is kind of exciting for me anyway. So I know it's got a long way to go, but, but this is an essential piece uh, of our, 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 our infrastructure and actually an essential piece to, to the integration we're doing. So integration is basically happening here. It's happening in conjunction with our, our, our security. It's happening in integration with our, with our back ends and, and our, through the ESB. We have uh, uh, data integration to our, to our large data sources and big data. And obviously we're, we're doing, uh, we need a, a, a decent uh, composition engine uh, here uh, to do aggregation and some of the things we do for our back-end services. So that's, that's a sort of a picture of the runtime. Is that about it, John? Yeah, and we're, we're getting near the end here. Um, <coughs> a little more on the gateway. Yeah, I mean, this, basically, I went through this. Uh, that's our gateway, pretty much what we're using for that. That's pretty much been Oh, yeah, this, was, this might be a good Yeah, so, so this is more of a, a little more granular view of, of what responsibilities we have in, in the gateway, basically authentication, throttling. Uh, this is a service proxy to, to either the, the downstream service or, or to the ESB. Um, we have uh, metrics obviously coming out of there, two-way SSL between uh, these, these, these runtimes. Uh, this has uh, a good amount of responsibility in it, this core function. There's uh, basically, um, I guess, transformation. Uh, we do a lot of smart routing, so that, that, comp that component will be onboarded later in the year, but, but this will be kind of a central routing hope, as well as metrics, and then obviously uh, in conjunction with our, our, our key store, which is identity server. But fundamentally, um, not only REST to SOAP transformation is done, uh, a lot of that's done in the, in the DB core library with both uh, XSLT and XPath. Uh, it depends on how fast we want to do. By the way, they only give me 200 milliseconds to get, uh, that's my budget end to end. So, so I can't consume more than, uh, they want me at 20 milliseconds <laughs> to do this stuff, which is a little stretch, and it's obviously that's in the view of the de developer, that's why we build a library of transformation so that we can vet that, perform, make it performant, and, and, and actually uh, reuse it. But, but really, that's, that's all we get. It's, it's, it's 200 milliseconds is a lot. And well, and think about what you mentioned earlier. We have a massive inventory of SOAP services. Having this kind of capability really is, allows you to deploy and leverage them in a new and different way. Right, and John can tell you, in our existing infrastructure, end-to-end, -end, <coughs> 200 milliseconds is a lot. So we, we do a lot of work in the transformation tier in zero milliseconds. It's all in memory. It's all cached. It's, it's, it's optimized to the hill. So as we start to decompose things, make them more flexible, and there's always a balance between flexibility and speed, uh, but you know, we got threads today, <laughs> we, you know, use threads. So, so that kind of need for speed is always evident in everything we do. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're capital in this layer. Just see what else. Uh, that, was, that was really it. So that was the, the core of it. Yeah, and um, with about a minute left, you know, we'll certainly be having questions, uh, as Mifan mentioned, when we have the panel in just a few minutes here. Um, you know, from an integration perspective, again, it's all about helping our business partners, whether they be inside Fidelity or outside Fidelity. W2 is really helping us do that, and uh, it's a good story. Yeah, and um, some of the, the counsel that we could give you, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's it, it, know your uh, contract first is a good philosophy. It's one I've always practiced, and I think one that should be practiced as you start to implement this. Um, the subscription, how do you tie APIs to, to a given application? How do you then provide the security model around that is, is essential. We spent a lot of time doing that. Um, the execution of, of the whole structure 
end to end. Um, obviously, we spent a lot of time doing that. We're in performance testing now. Um, looking forward to our first implementation in, in early 2017, uh, coming up soon. And, uh, and then rolling out uh, throughout 2017 with, uh, with a variety of APIs that, that we have. So fundamentally, that's it. Um, look forward to your questions at the panel, but uh, that's our story. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.